I work for Puppet. Um, and because this uh, talk is going to be um, fairly relevant to the way that Puppet actually works, I'm going to start by introducing our product a little bit on a high level. Um, so Puppet is a tool for system administrators that lets them describe the way that they want their system to look in code. So if you are a person responsible for uh, managing a bunch of servers at a company, what Puppet lets you do is sort of write out in code, like with if statements and actual logic, like I want my ser one server over here to be configured this way and another server to be configured that way and a third one like this. Um, and Puppet is a tool for automating that configuration to be deployed to all those nodes. So the way it works is that there is a central Puppet master um, that sort of has all of this code on it and every 30 minutes, each of the servers in your fleet will check into the master and ask, hey, what's my configuration supposed to be? And the master will look through all the code and compile a catalog for that node and send the catalog back to the server, which will then execute all of those instructions and configure itself the way that the administrator wants it to look. Um, so my job at Puppet is actually, um, we, my team is responsible for the open source core of that master, the Puppet master. Um, that code base is uh, primarily a server written in Clojure, um, but all of the business logic of Puppet is implemented in Ruby. All of our oldest code is in Ruby, so all of the code that compiles the catalogs for configuring the nodes is all in Ruby. So when we implemented this new Puppet server in Clojure, we still had a lot of Ruby to deal with. And since Clojure is a functional language that runs on the Java virtual machine, we decided to look into JRuby instead of porting all of our code over to Clojure, running the Ruby code on the JVM alongside our Clojure application. So to get started into the meat of the presentation, what is JRuby? So normally when you have a Ruby script, it's just a, test, a text file and your computer doesn't know what to do with that. So we, uh, that text file gets interpreted by a C program called MRI, usually. Um, and what this program does is it reads the file from top to bottom and it takes each line, like an instruction, and compiles it into code that your operating system can understand and sort of issues instructions to the operating system. This is how Ruby usually works. This is different than a language, for example, like Java, where the text file is taken and compiled down into something called uh, bytecode, um, which is sort of a separate set of instructions, a little bit of an intermediate language that is then interpreted by the Java virtual machine into instructions that your machine can understand. So it's a little bit more complicated uh, with a language like Java. Um, but it turns out that we can treat Ruby the same way. And that's where JRuby comes in. JRuby is a different interpreter for Ruby that takes the Ruby code instructions and compiles them to that same Java virtual machine bytecode, and then the Java virtual machine will in turn issue instructions to the operating system. So why would someone want to like insert this extra complexity, this extra layer into their system? Why would someone want to use the JVM? First off, um, so the the JVM was introduced in 1994 as sort of a layer on top of your operating system. Uh, it was developed by people who um, wanted this easy way to compile code down uh, once and then be able to run that code anywhere. So one of the original slogans for Java, which was the first language that ran on this sort of virtual architecture, was to write it once, run it anywhere. Um, so this portability is really nice because for something like MRI, because it's written in C, for every platform you want to run it on, you have to build this special interpreter for every single platform. And if you're a user of Ruby, you have to be aware of that. Uh, and this is actually really relevant for what we do at Puppet because we support a lot of very strange operating systems that are not as mainstream as like Mac or Ubuntu. And so, we actually at Puppet will build our own Ruby interpreters and ship them alongside our products because we have to deal with this 
sort of like native operating system code that is the way that Ruby normally runs. So the JVM, which sort of provides an abstraction on top of that, is kind of an attract attractive option, especially when you consider that because it is targeted by so many different languages, Java, Clojure, which is what we use at Puppet, um, Kotlin, which is becoming really popular for Android development, and Scala, uh, in addition to JRuby, it gets a lot of attention from a lot of people. And that's resulted in it, being, it receiving a lot of optimizations and security improvements. There's a lot of people making it better all the time. So if you can write code that targets this JVM, you get to take advantage of all of those benefits and improvements that people are putting into it. In addition to that, uh, because all of these different languages compile down to the same bytecode, it's really easy to get your programming languages to uh, sort of like interop with one another. It's so if you're writing JRuby, uh, or if you're writing Ruby and you're running it on JRuby, it's fairly easy to take advantage of some Java libraries that are out there. So for example, if they're, you know, Ruby's sort of notorious for being not super great for doing like a lot of uh, like computationally intensive stuff or things that require a lot of uh, like really great performance. But if you're running on JRuby, it's really easy to call out into Java, for example, which is better at those kinds of things, and use that as part of your main Ruby program. Maybe you don't want to write Java all the time because you think it's gross or something, but um, it's, you can still take advantage of the interop capabilities if you're using JRuby. Um, so, how did we get here at Puppet? Um, our first sort of like foray into the JVM actually started, uh, had nothing to do with JRuby or anything like that. Um, we had some people at the company who had started learning Clojure, which like I said, is a functional language. It's pretty niche still to this day. You don't find a lot of people who write it. You don't see a lot of jobs with it. Um, but it is a derivative of Lisp, if anybody knows what Lisp is, um, and the thing about functional languages is that they're really good for applications that have a lot of concurrency needs. Um, they force like different kinds of discipline on the programmer, and a lot of the people at Puppet thought this was a really cool idea and decided that when they were gonna write their new database application, they were gonna write it in Clojure. Um, so in 2012, we released Puppet DB which is sort of like a layer over the like bare Postgres databases we were using before that's responsible for taking in data from Puppet, uh, transforming it into something the database can understand, and then pulling information back out of the database and giving it back to Puppet. Um, it's the kind of thing that does benefit from good concurrency models and so forth. Uh, and they were so excited with their su success with this product that they decided to build a whole server framework in Clojure. And that server framework is called Trapper Keeper. Um, it's actually used by Boeing, among other companies today outside of Puppet because it's all open source. Um, so they built this uh, service server framework uh, called Trapper Keeper in Clojure and decided that they were going to sort of re-architect the Puppet Master to use this framework. At the time, we were starting to sign some larger customers who, were, who had bigger needs. Uh, they, they had like more servers to manage and they were having major problems with the performance of our old Ruby code base. Um, when we first introduced Puppet Server, we saw a performance increase of like two to three times better and we're like, this is great. Um, but what it meant is that we still had all of the core business logic of Puppet in Ruby. There's a lot of code there, <laughs> thousands, tens of thousands of lines. And we didn't have time to port all that to Clojure. We couldn't like wholesale abandon the Ruby code base. So we started looking into JRuby. And we arrived at this rather interesting architecture uh, for Puppet Server. So like I said, the main application of Puppet Server is a uh, like Trapper Keeper application. Um, it does things like handling requests. Uh, it has a certificate authority service. It does you know, some like general sort of like surface level servery type things. Um, but it doesn't know how to compile catalogs uh, for, for configuring nodes. Um, it doesn't know how to serve up users files for, uh, you know, to like send out to their nodes and so on and so forth. So what we did uh, is we created this JRuby pool, 
So it's not something that you find really anywhere else. No one really uses JRuby like this except us. Um, maybe for good reason. Um, so the thing with the big old Puppet code base is that it was not thread safe. You could not send multiple node requests to it and have them be processed concurrently. They would step all over each other. You could be compiling a catalog for one node and you'd start for a second one and they'd just clobber each other. It was terrible. Um, so, but we really wanted this new server to be able to run things concurrently because that would really help with our performance issues. So we decided to um, sort of make these J, to run multiple instances of Puppet in a pool, all on JRuby, the entrance of which was gated by, by Puppet Server. So, when, so the way it works is when Puppet Server receives a request, say, um, asking to receive puppets, to retrieve Puppet settings or requesting a catalog, what it will do is it will look at its pool of JRubies for one that's idle, that's not currently processing a request, and it will check it out and it will say, hey, here, give me this thing, give me this catalog and that JRuby will process the request, return the result, and then Puppet Server will send it back to the node making the request. Um, if all of the JRubies are currently busy, the request will wait in line until one becomes idle, and then a new JRuby will be checked out. Um, this allows us to process a bunch of requests concurrently, as many as you have JRuby instances. So you could have just one if you didn't have that many nodes and don't really care about it, um, or you could have a dozen of these running around. <laughs> So this is kind of a cool architecture, but there are a number of downsides to doing it this way. Um, for one thing, compared to just the bare Ruby application, introducing this closure layer and JRuby and so forth adds a lot of layers for us to deal with. And there's a number of implications to that. Um, debugging and error handling in the system is hard. Um, Closure is notorious for its ridiculous stack traces. We're talking like hundreds of lines of just stack trace. Um, I don't know why they haven't fixed it yet, but that only gets worse when you introduce JRuby as well. So if like something throws an exception inside the Puppet code base, the way that it surfaces out to the outside of the server is a lot of times pretty impenetrable um, and hard to reason about. We're trying to make improvements to that all the time, but uh, it's still hard. Um, uh, and in addition, the JVM languages are well known for having really good debugging tools. If anyone has ever used an IDE like Eclipse or IntelliJ, they know that there's some really good like visual debugging aids. You can set breakpoints in the margins of your file. You can step through code, so on and so forth. Those don't translate to Ruby at all. They don't work in JRuby. Um, and likewise, some of the Ruby debugging tools like Pry uh, can be a little bit hard. Not all of them work on JRuby or are maintained for JRuby. Um, so that debugging divide has been a continual challenge for us. Furthermore, like I said, nobody else really uses JRuby this way. Um, the JRuby is maintained by just a small handful of people. Um, the code base is written in Java. You know, it interprets Ruby programs and they, like I said, it's probably, I think it's only two or three people who actually are like full-time maintainers of it. And so when we set our thing up like this and discover some bugs and we're like, hey, can you fix this thing for us? They're like, no. Um, we have so many other people that uh, are doing things that we actually recommend um, that, that come before you. So a lot of times we've had to sort of uh, work through our issues on our own. Um, I don't think we've ever actually put up PRs against uh, that's not true. I think maybe some of the people before my time at Puppet actually contributed back to JRuby, um, but it is a really complicated code base. So uh, it is all open source though, so that's fun. Um, so we have an unsupported architecture. The other thing is you might imagine, like I said, each one of those JRuby instances is running its own instance of Puppet. And that means that the memory footprint, footprint for Puppet server is big. Um, we recommend sort of as a bare minimum that you dedicate at least two gigabytes of RAM to this process uh, that's running. And some of our, for our uh, enterprise uh, deploys, we recommend at least six gigs. And some of our larger customers are using as many, four, as many as 64 gigabytes of RAM to run Puppet Server because they need so many JRuby instances to handle the load of the nodes that they are trying to configure. Um, and lastly, and this is the one that bit us uh, earlier this year, um, 
when you are dealing with like this many different um, sort of like language frameworks and so forth like fitted together, you're at the mercy of a lot of people's different release cycles and support for one another. Um, so not only do we have to contend with things like right now, um, the new releases of Java that are coming out, Java 10, Java 11, that affect the JVM that we're running on, we also have to deal with Ruby's release cycle, um, which they recently just released 2.5, we're actually on top of that one. But you also have to deal with JRuby in the middle. Um, and for a long time, uh, the sort of only stable version of JRuby that was out was not Ruby 2. It was only, it only supported Ruby 1.9 which meant that, around, so the major version that changed that was released in 2016. And for reference, Ruby 1.9 was end of life in, in early, early 2014. So they were about two years behind the times. And we weren't actually able to adopt that new version of JRuby uh, right off the bat because it turns out that it had really bad performance problems and used even more memory than the old version. <laughs> Um, so around October of 20, I think I might, no, I didn't make other slides. Um, around October of 2016, we started trying to adopt this new version of JRuby and found out that it was on the order of 10 to 12 times slower for us than the old version, which was just completely untenable. Uh, but of course, we really wanted to get off the, older, the old version of Ruby because it wasn't receiving security updates anymore. It was a really bad story for us. Um, so earlier this year, starting about January, uh, my team started like, we're really gonna hunker down and we're gonna fix this JRuby thing. Um, so we dove deep into JVM profiling and digging around in JRuby source code and twiddling with all of the flags. Turns out that the JVM is very configurable and that the documentation is sort of there. Um, so after many, many experiments, uh, we set up all kinds of automation to uh, load test our applications over long periods of time and record all the results, uh, fiddle around with different settings so we could sort of do a like uh, scientific method on figuring out what was impacting our slow performance. We were finally able to unlock a key and get our performance sort of back in line with the new version and we were finally able to drop old Ruby versions uh, in the release that went out earlier this month. Um, so Puppet is finally Ruby 2 only. Congratulations. Thanks, JRuby. Um, and uh, yeah, it was quite an, quite an adventure. Um, I guess in conclusion, would we do it again? Like I said, the JVM brings a lot of benefits with it. It is a really good uh, platform to build your server-side applications on. Um, given that we didn't have time to rewrite our entire Ruby code base in another language, and we considered other things besides Clojure, C++ was another major option that we were considering that also sort of, that, that effort has pretty much died. Um, uh, JRuby was actually a pretty solid option. We had to do very little to get it to work sort of right out of the box, apart from like figuring out what the architecture was going to be. Pretty much all of the code that we needed to work on JRuby did. Um, so I guess uh, that, that was pretty convenient. Um, but I will say my, my biggest caveat to all this is that when you're working with a framework, try to follow their like recommendations for how to use it because uh, if you do, they're much more likely to support you in what you're trying to do and that can be really, really helpful. As someone who works for a company that has a like highly configurable software that people do all kinds of things with, if you file that bug because you're doing something weird that like we don't care about, you are not gonna get attention, I'm sorry. Um, so, yeah, I guess in conclusion, will we do it again? Yeah, probably. Because um, it made business sense at the time and I think to this day we're still getting benefit out of it. Uh, will we stay with this architecture forever? Hopefully not, but I don't really know what that future will look like. We're slowly moving more and more things out of Ruby, mostly to Clojure. This most recent release that we did of Puppet finally killed the old certificate authority that was in Ruby. That was the second thing my, my team did this year. We used to maintain two side by side uh, implementations of our certificate issuing service, one in Ruby, one in Clojure. We finally killed the Ruby one this year, which is a huge benefit to maintainability. So we're slowly moving more and more in the direction of getting more things out of Ruby onto the JVM. But in the meantime, this has actually served us pretty well. <laughs>
So that's it. Yes. I apologize. It's been a couple of years since I've looked into this, but there was some academic uh, work in static analysis of Ruby code to, 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 to run on the JVM, and it, and it just made it like 10 times faster. Did you guys look into that stuff? Um, so I think I want to say that one of my other teammates, um, while we were doing this uh, analysis of the JRuby thing, like went down those those avenues a little bit. Um, there's a number of different options for uh, like compiled Ruby of various kinds. Um, I don't remember the name of the exact one that she looked at. It may have been this. Um, yeah, 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 right. Um, we looked at some of those things, not in a whole lot of detail, mostly because a lot of them aren't terribly stable still at this point. They're more experimental, and that wasn't really something that we could risk for like a core part of our product. Oh, yeah. A whole session on, on it because you guys are using C or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So, fun fact I was actually hired as an intern to do C at Puppet in 2015. That's where I started there. Um, it wound up being a maintainability, like two things, a maintainability nightmare in the sense of that thing I said about like the JVM is great because it's portable. C is the opposite of that. Like even the difference between like the main ones, you know, like Linux, Mac, and Windows are huge differences that you have to deal with like as you're building all of your code, as you are writing all of your code. Um, and the, the strain on our um, like release and build infrastructure was crazy. Um, we, cur we still have a couple of small parts of the code base that are in C++. They probably will stay that way. Um, but the idea of doing more that way, it just seemed like it was just not going to be worth the maintainability costs of it. That and the language itself is um, hard to write correctly, um, and it requires a lot of expertise and discipline. And we already have such a high, like steep learning curve for coming to work at Puppet that adding C++ on top of that is just, it's hard. I mean, Clojure's bad enough uh, in that regard. Um, <laughs> But at least closure requires a little bit less discipline to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, so it's still there, but I, I don't think that there has been any new code written in C++ for quite some time. Um, does the JVM, does the JVM limit you in any way with Ruby and um, some of Ruby's dynamic abilities? Um, so no, uh, but we have some suspicion that uh, some of those things are significantly slower than they ought to be. Um, again, this would, like, in order to actually investigate this, we ended up not having to dig in to these elements as much as we, we were afraid we were going to have to dig deeper for this performance issue that we were seeing into things like how JRuby implements Ruby's metaprogramming, because we use a lot of metaprogramming in Puppet. Um, and the answer, it all works right now. But there's definitely some things that are probably not as um, performant as they could be. Um, again, we ended up finding just like tweaks of the system itself, like configuration of the JVM itself got us out of that hole. But there was definitely a little bit of like, maybe we're going to have to plunge into the source code here. So actually, the only like main issues I think that we have with JRuby right now is that um, some stuff around OpenSSL does not work correctly. Like if you are using Ruby's OpenSSL objects, they don't get initialized correctly when you're running them on the JVM. And luckily for us, we were not trying to do that. Like I said, we had we had a bunch of uh, like OpenSSL code in Ruby, but it wasn't any code that needed to be called like from the server while the server was running. The server had its own like certificate authority implementation. So we didn't really have to worry about it. But recently, we um, made an effort to be able to run all of our spec tests on JRuby. And we ended up having to skip all of the spec tests that had to do with OpenSSL stuff because it's just not implemented right. Um, and that's, I guess, the pitfall of using something that is like a little bit more niche and maintained by people who I'm still not sure if they're paid to do it. Um, uh, so is that there's just gaps. Um, but no, other than that, like there hasn't been a whole lot. Um, if you're going to do it, 
please, please, please don't use exception handling as control flow. That one's real bad. The JVM is, has really heavyweight exception unwi unwinding, and so if you're just doing the like begin rescue like for random reasons, it's going to be really, really slow in JRuby. That we had to ma definitely make some updates around that. Anything else? Yeah. Are there any projects you would recommend using JRuby for? Is there any type of project? So, actually, I think I forgot to talk about this because it wasn't on my slide. Um, the main thing that people do use JRuby for is if they have a Ruby application and um, a lot of times just switching to run it on JRuby will increase its performance, like to some extent. Um, so if you have something that you know is like um, needing to do a lot of computation or so forth, um, one thing that JRuby has and that the JVM has actually in general is something called a just-in-time compiler. And what happens is as the code is being run and it starts being able to predict which code paths are going to be taken and it will sort of like make assumptions about that so that like in the happy path or the most common case, it doesn't have to like do a bunch of condition checking. Um, so being able to take advantage of things like that for things where you're like doing the same operation over and over again, you can see a lot of performance benefits from uh, using the JVM for that. Um, that's particularly true in JRuby 9K, the, the newest version of JRuby that's come out. Um, so really like unless you're looking for that performance benefit or there's some like interop with Java or another JVM language that you really need for some reason, I don't think it's probably worth it for you. But again, if you're looking for performance or for interop with a language because there's like some specific library that's in Java that you really need, it might be worth considering. Most people do it inside out from the way we're doing it. They have a Ruby program that wants to call out to Java, not the other way around. Um, Anything else? Thank you. Yeah.